Hello and welcome to the third episode of Notice Board done in partnership with HR Katha. I'm Abhijit Bhaduri and today I want to talk to you about a question that everyone has been asking and which is what is common to, um, let's look at some of the names, Satya Nadella, Shantanu Narayan, Rajiv Suri, Puneet Ranjan, George Kurian, um, Sundar Pichai, what's common to all of them? Well, they are all Indian born CEOs who have now become the head of some of the largest corporations in this world. So what really is happening? Is it a trend? Is this a blip? Is this the exception that proves the rule? What is it? And my belief is that, you know, this whole notion of leadership of the digital organizations are changing. The concept of it is becoming very different. And one of the things that is happening is all jobs are becoming tech jobs. All organizations are becoming tech organizations because all businesses are necessarily technical. And just having an app or having a web page doesn't make you digital. Understanding the core basics of technology actually is very important today for a leader, regardless of which function the person is in. But then there's a difference in the role that happens when a person moves from being the CXO to the CEO. So what is that difference? Each one of these people have had a very strong technical background and that has been the hallmark of the educational system of India where they've had terrific education and understood how to adapt themselves in the social settings of a new country and culture. So like a lot of immigrants and there are enough studies which talk about the fact that immigrants actually work a little harder. Immigrants are there to prove themselves and the first thing that they have to do is to adapt themselves into a new country, learn the new norms, learn the norms of behavior and figure out how to build their own network in a place where nothing exists. So these people are all people who have established themselves from ground zero and they've had the advantage of working with very diverse countries and very different kinds of people, many different kinds of talent pools and this is what gives the CEO of tomorrow a big advantage. So I hope that this is going to be not the exception. The next time when we talk about it, I hope that there will be another couple of names that we'll talk about of very large businesses and what do you think? Do you think this is uh, really something that is beginning to take shape or is this the exception and we should really not worry about it? What do you think? I'd love to hear hear that from you but on to our second story now have you ever wondered where the space where you sit actually changes the relationship that you hold between your colleagues and uh, the overall nature of the company the culture and all of that that changes because of space. So how do I know this? Because in 1963, there was a person called Edward Hall who actually created the science of the space, proxemics, you know, how distances between people changes their behavior. It's a really fascinating set of things that he studied. And later on, there was a company that actually adopted that basis and built it into the way they design furniture. But, you know, there have been many other places where I think this comes up really clearly. Think about how your behavior changes when you travel, uh, say, in a very crowded elevator. Doesn't that change the way you interact with people? So if you are talking to somebody and you walk into a very crowded elevator, even though the person is standing right next to you with other people, you become conscious, you kind of really measure how you're being evaluated by others and all of that, it's natural. But then imagine when it happens on a really large scale in an organization. So should the organizations have open spaces? Um, how does it impact people who are introverts? Do they get disturbed? Um, a lot of times you notice that people use those noise cancellation headphones and plug it into their uh, ears and then start to do work when they are trying to do deep work. Or is it that the nature of work actually changes that you know some part of the work that you do demands collaboration with people so you need space for that some part of the work actually needs you to work by yourself and sometimes you need work spaces which really let you do deep concentrated work which Cal Newport defines as deep work if you have not read that book that's a lovely book I would recommend so when you imagine office space what does it do? Does it change culture? Does it build a culture of collaboration and uh, creativity? Is that defined by space? So 
who better to ask than the MD of a company called Steelcase? They design office furniture. And when I asked Praveen Rawal, the MD, uh, he actually mentioned this really clearly. Welcome to Notice Board. I wanted to ask you, how does the space that you have in the organization, how does that shape culture? To the question around space, how does shape, uh, space shape culture? It is, uh, it's a very valid uh, question for reasons that uh, in actuality, space shapes behavior. Employees who work for organizations look forward to space leadership for mending their ways, for, for working in ways that they want to work. I think the openness in a space, the taking forward of principles and vision of the organization adds and impacts working culture very much. We have in our working across the globe seen that as you open up spaces and as you give plurality of spaces to employees to work, you give them the choice of place, technology, presence, they get more empowered. They feel more empowered about the space. They feel more empowered about their work and they work better. MD of Steelcase had to say, but I have another interesting data point to share with you. Steelcase has done a study across many different countries and what they found is the concept of privacy actually changes from country to country. Uh, so for example, in many of the Western cultures, the concept of privacy is all about sensory stimulation. So the kind of things that uh, you want to see, the kind of things that you want to hear, the, uh, all of that needs to be controlled in order for a person to feel that the office respects his or her privacy. The Chinese notion of privacy doesn't have anything to do with space, but it certainly has a lot to do with the trading of information. So the kind of information I'm privy to or the kind of information about me that others know uh, actually defines the concept of privacy in China. But when it comes to India, what do you think is our notion of privacy? Because I think sometimes we are a collective nation. So the concept of privacy gets fairly blurred in many ways because people will step out and ask you. If you don't volunteer information, people will come and ask you, hey, tell me about what's happening and what's going on. So is that a good thing? Does it put us in an advantageous position as the nature of work changes? I'd love to hear that from you. What do you think? One piece of news that really, really made me really happy and proud was the gesture of the Air India employees who risked their lives and went all the way across to Wuhan. Despite all that you read about the coronavirus and everything else, they did that. They brought back the people from there. What a tremendous act and my salute to them. Uh, and this is probably one of the questions that uh, leads us to think, what makes people do something like that? What is it? Is that only in crisis that we can tap into that element of people? Or is it something that workspaces can create for themselves? That's an interesting question. I wonder if we have, uh, you know, we know that there is a country like Bhutan which measures gross domestic happiness. But what about organizations? What if we were to create a measure for happiness for organizations? Where would your organization fit in? I'd love to hear from you. Tell me about what that measure should be. How would you know that your workplace is really happy and uh, what is going to make it better would be worth exploring. What do you think? Right? And uh, well, on a personal note, I am off to the Vidarbha Literary Festival in Nagpur. This is unique because it is actually a literary fest celebrating non-fiction writers. So people like me have to show up. I'll let you know what happened there. Till the next time, thank you very much for watching. Do share this and encourage us. It really matters a lot when you tell us you liked it. Till the next time, goodbye.